The Jerry Powell Podcast is brought to you by Archstone Foundation, improving the health and well being of older Californians and their caregivers. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast. This is Eric Guadera. This is Alex Smith. And Alex, who do we have with us today? It's a full house. We are delighted to welcome um, Allison Kestenbaum, who is a board certified chaplain and certified pastoral educator. I need to hear from Allison what that means. And is the um, a palliative care chaplain at UC San Diego and a Sojourn Scholar. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast, Allison. Thanks. So good to be here. We're also delighted to welcome Katie Hyman, who is a board certified chaplain and director of palliative care at Memorial Care Long Beach Medical Center. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast, Katie. Thanks so much for having us today. I'm excited. And we're delighted to welcome Paul Galshoot, who is a research chaplain at the University of Minnesota Medical Center and is also the convener of the Hospice and Palliative Care Spiritual Care Research Network, which we look forward to hearing more about as well. Welcome, Jerry Powell. Paul. Thanks very much for being here. It's great to be here. So we're going to be talking about spiritual care and palliative care. But before we do, we always start off with a song request. Paul, do you have the song request? We do. A beloved palliative chaplain colleague suggested Jeff Tweedy's A Robin or a Wren. Mm. Who was that colleague? Who's it coming from? Yeah, Denise Hess. She's the director of supportive care for the Catholic Health Association. Great. I love Jeff Tweedy. Um, love his uh, Wilco stuff and his solo stuff. The lyrics to this song are fantastic. When I first heard it, thank you for this suggestion, I didn't know what he was saying because he kind of mumbles them in the background. But then when I read the lyrics, it's like, oh, this is beautiful. So I'm going to try and bring out the lyrics a little more. Here we go. At the last, last call, when it's time for us all. Goodbye. I know I'm gonna cry. I know I'm gonna cry because all in all, I'm just having a ball being alive, and I don't want to die. get to the end at the end. I had to split it in half. It's just a beautiful ending. Wait for it, folks. Any idea why that song was picked? I could say a little. It talks about reincarnation. as this beautiful ending of the person who saying, well, I, I died and then I'm one day I'll come back as a Robin or a Wren and sit outside your window and sing you a song and you'll just kind of recognize it and a tear will slide down your face and you'll realize and I'll, I'll be alive again. You know, I'll be back um, in your memory. Great song. Well, that's very chaplain y kind of song. (laughs) (laughs) Well, let's talk about this. So, uh, we're going to be talking about spirituality and palliative care. Maybe before we talk about the evidence base and how, what's our role in this from interprofessional teams. When we say spirituality, what do we actually mean and how is it different? than, let's say, religiousness or religion? One of our favorite questions to engage on. Um, So what's nice about the answer that I'm going to give you is that um, there actually is a consensus definition from the palliative care community um, that was come up with by um, uh, Christina Pokalski is the first, first author on this, but social worker, chaplain, um, ethicist, physician, all got together back in 2009 and actually came up with a consensus definition of spirituality. And we we really like it. <laughs> so we thought that's a good place to start. But um, it, even though it comes from the palliative care community, I know not everyone knows it. So, um, and when you, when I share it with you, you'll hear actually that religion is not specifically mentioned. So I'll mention why I think that is. Um, but to just give you an overview of that definition, um, it acknowledges that spirituality is an aspect of humanity, meaning something that we all have, which is what's suggested there. Um, and it can be the way that people seek meaning and purpose, the way they experience 
connections to themselves, to others. It could be the connection to nature, the sacred. Um, so it really covers a very broad um, range. Um, and um, I think part of the reason why religion is not mentioned in there is because all of those things can be expressed through religion. But, you know, m one thing that I really do believe is that I think all people are spiritual, but maybe not everyone is religious, or religion is one particular way of expressing spirituality. Mm. Um, so we're excited to see that represented in that definition. So do you think there's something inherently, though, religious about the word spirituality as it has the word spirit in it? And, you know, probably for some folks, uh, maybe some atheists, like who, who believe like maybe people don't have spirits or souls and this is what it is. Thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, I think we're always going to be limited by language, but I mean, in the United States, people who are spiritual, but not religious and, and atheists are certainly growing. And so I expect our language will take a little bit of time to catch up. Yeah. And the roots of chaplaincy are very much grounded in sort of white Protestant Christian practice. And so we're, it, it's, it's taking some time, I think, for language to catch up with that. Yeah. I, any uh, notable, notable changes that you've seen over the last 10 years in that regard? Yes. Definitely. I mean, we know statistically the trends are trending toward um, at least moving away somewhat from affiliation, specific religious affiliation. So more people are expressing their spirituality or religiosity, um, you know, in their kind of own personal way or ways that yeah. were different, maybe from 20, 30 years ago. Um, and we see that in palliative care. Um, you know, this is a very unique slice that I have, but I work at UC San Diego Health and we are a huge science school and we have a bunch of, you know, oceanographers and engineers around and they have this incredible spiritual interaction with their scientific mind and their science life. So when we do spiritual screening, spiritual assessment with them, that's the kind of things that come out, you know, that are related to their legacy, the purpose of their life. And so we could hear those things and think, well, what does engineering have to do <laughs> with mm. spiritual care? But those are the things that are most connected to, you know, their things like quality of life and values, which we care so much about in palliative care. Yeah. And, you know, just thinking about, you know, since it's, it seems like a very all-encompassing, like, term spirituality and it makes me think when we practically put it in in the care that we deliver how should we assess for it because it, it does seem like you know even the word can mean a lot of different things to different people and even that definition you mentioned is very all-encompassing how do we actually assess for it very, yeah, great question, um, because that brings us very much to the practicality. Um, and I think that's what we love as chaplains. Like, we get to be applied, you know, spiritual <laughs> um, folks, um, you know, because there is that opportunity, you know, that everything is so immediate in in healthcare and in palliative care. So, yeah, so um, we have a couple different categories that we have in, in our profession in chaplaincy, where we distinguish between spiritual screening, versus spiritual assessment, versus spiritual history, which may be a lot more interesting mm. to us <laughs> than others. But I but I think it is practical in that, you know, spiritual screening is something that anybody on the team can do, any discipline, because it's really just a, a question. And there are a bunch of good ones out there. Some are much more practical, like, you know, what is your spiritual or, you know, religious practice? Mm -hmm. And then there's another great one um, uh, from Karen Steinhauser and her team, are you at peace, right? That that can be a spiritual screening. Um, so that's something anyone can ask. And then that can trigger um, a chaplain being involved um, to do what we call assessment. So for chaplains, it was a really big deal to get to a place where we would make an assessment. So we're not just like having an intuitive conversation with someone, though our intuition is a big part of what we do, but that we actually would sort of stake a claim and say, okay, we think this is where the person's spiritual need is, right? Mm -hmm. This is where we think their spiritual resources are. And we're going to work with the team to integrate that to the plan of care. So we're going to actually not only have an assessment, but we're going to talk about the specific interventions we're going to do, and we're going to name outcomes, you know, so what does spiritual healing for this individual look like and how can we as a team help them get there? Mm -hmm. I wonder, you know, as a doctor who serves on a palliative care service, what the limits are and where this boundary should be for me in assessing spirituality 
um, of my patients? Like, uh, are the bounds individual, much like, say, language fluency is individual? Like, I may have had some training prior or more experience um, or less. Or is there sort of like, are there some hard and fast lines where you feel like, you know, I wouldn't really go into asking your patients about their relationship with God because that's, you know, I don't know if you're going to be able to get out of that. Or, um, you know, sort of nuances of arguing uh, or talking about, you know, the book of Job or um, why this might be happening, this horrible thing might be happening to you uh, um, at this time. I think you'd be great allegorically wrestling with Job. Alex, <laughs> no, but I think you're right. It's determinative by the person doing it. And I think all the above that you named, I think would be a lot of, uh, I don't know, I don't say it'd be really meaningful um, to come to rounds some morning and hear that somebody engaged in this 20 minute conversation with a patient about all things like, you know, why is, does, does God uh, allow suffering? And it led to this big kind of question, not that I agree with that necessarily, but just that it led to this uh kind of sitting with the person in the valley of their moment of their lives. Mm-hmm. So we don't, I don't want a, a clinician beyond a chaplain to feel uncomfortable, however. Mm-hmm. You know, I think of it a little bit like, um, it, particularly, it would be team specific, but, you know, a chaplain can ask somebody, are you having pain? And chaplain can learn about basic pain assessment. Like, tell me a little bit about the pain. Is it radiating pain? What makes it better? What makes it worse? Um, depending on how much training they've had in that assessment. But um, I am not going to prescribe anybody anything for that. Mm -hmm. So recognizing where I can ask questions and then hand off, I think it's very similar. So if you're going to ask something that you don't have um, an intervention for, Mm -hmm. then that's probably your limit. And then also I think it's worked out in the context of different teams and how Mm -hmm. much comfort people have with transdisciplinary practice, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Right. That's beautifully said, Katie. And that, I think, is an analogy that will appeal to many of our listeners, most of whom are not chaplains, though we do have some chaplains who listen. Um, thank you. You've got three of them here today. Oh, great. <laughs> right, and can I go back to screening versus spiritual history? What's the difference again? And where did those tools, like the, the, I think the FICA tool and the other tools, is that a screener? Is that an assessment? Is that a history tool? Yeah, so technically that's a history tool, but you know, I actually um, had a big change of heart around uh, the FICA tool is amazing. It's taught everywhere. It's created by you know incredible leaders in in the field. And, and for our listeners, is- can you just describe it real quick if you if you can? Yeah. Um, does someone have the acronym handy? Yeah, I got. Yeah. I'll describe it since I pulled that's, it up. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so uh, FICA um, is basically a framework. And again, I'm not sure is it a, a history, history or an assessment, but basically F, faith, belief, meaning, I, importance and influence, C is community, and A is address and action and care. How should yes. I address these issues in healthcare? Um, those types of questions. Right. And what makes it a history is that we're asking questions, but the tool doesn't necessarily guide us in what to do once we get answers. Spiritual assessment, you know, should do that. But what can be really amazing about spiritual histories, especially for non-chaplain providers, is that it... um, it actually gives a glimpse into the patient's life and and makes them even it helps their humanity come out even more. So, <clears throat> I used to think that FICA was all about the patient, and it is. But I've learned, especially over the least last couple of years with COVID, where you know some f- clinicians were not able to really get to know anything about their patient because you know maybe they were in an ICU or you know not able to communicate. They didn't have any family visiting. But you know if they could find out some of the sort of FICA things either from the family family, you know, or from the patient's medical record, it gave them more of a glimpse into their sort of whole humanity. So we actually see these spiritual histories being very useful for clinicians. Um, The challenge, though, is this whole question of like asking, patients can get anxious sometimes when we ask them lots of questions and don't tell them why we're asking them that information. And some people, you know, the spirituality and religion can be kind of private. So I think, you know, it can be great to ask these questions, but just sort of know what you're going to do with it (laughs) once you pull out the info. Yeah. Go ahead, Paul. No, I was just going to say, because um, this comes up a lot, like you are naming with the screen, the history. For me, it's just like the history, kind of borrow that word story out of it. 
it's just some nice really interview questions to get the ball rolling and then the screen is there's something bad going on and that's where we like to know spiritual pain distress struggle those kinds of things mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a nice for me uh, sometimes i'll offer that for people as a simple way to kind of grasp it yeah to be honest, that you said it you said spiritual pain C- could you give an example of of somebody who's in spiritual pain at, for our listeners and I hope I'm not jumping ahead on some of these questions, could this, but this is uh, an example of it. Uh, it could be a tough decision-making moment uh, with somebody in the ICU, and they feel like they need to kind of carry on and uh, move on with the interventions that may not be comfortable for them or that they even want, but that somehow they believe God is wanting them to continue to, to do that. And, you know, why is God wanting me to do this? And why does my religion teach me as such? So, we can have all these moral pieces and uh, existential complexity. And um, uh, there's a guy, Dr. Marvin Nogato guy uh, at uh, MD Anderson has a classic question. Um, are you experiencing a spiritual pain that's not physical? Are, Allison, you know it better than I do. I'm not getting that right because um, of what you this recent project we worked on. Yeah. Um, so the question is, are you experiencing spiritual oh, pain? Oh. Spiritual pain is pain deep in your soul, soul being, that's not yeah, physical. Yeah, yeah. And it sort of aligns up with like we pro- probably a lot of people are familiar with the the ESAS, you know, the Edmonton Symptom Assessment Scale. And it's sort of mm-hmm. answered with the same scale, but it's this question of, you know, that that different kind of pain. Yeah. Thank you. So uh what if what if it turns up, yes, <laughs> I am, I am feeling that. Do we just Say okay, great. We'll have the chaplain come by. <laughs> um, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna answer this with my sort of like systems um, director hat on, which would be to say you should probably go and talk to the spiritual care department in your hospital to find out some of what they would like you to say um, and how what their availability is and what um, how they would like to be contacted. Um, so. But assuming that you have uh, done that and you have a good relationship and you know what to do, um, then yes, I think you can say, sounds like there's a lot of of pain here. Um, I'm going to have a colleague of mine, Allison, stop by. She's from our spiritual care department. And I think she can spend some more time talking through this with you. It's it's also interesting. You didn't use the word chaplain. You said spiritual care department. Is is that a uh, a very thoughtful word choice, or is it interchangeable? Um, I'll speak for myself, but then Allison and Paul, feel free to chime in. Uh, chaplain can be pretty loaded um, yeah. a, a word, and people have uh, connotations with particularly, I think, uh, either maybe military or also. Uh, people coming in from a specific religious perspective. Um, But I'm also in Southern California. And so uh, I know that there are other regions of the country where it's, it's less loaded. I don't know, Paul, what it's like for you in Minnesota. For me, it's the classic story. um, Somebody with the hospice that used to be connected to our um, healthcare team tells us that she went in and did the intake and said, yeah, we've got all these services and supports and, and we have a spiritual care person on the team. That's great. I'd love to see a spiritual care person. I just don't want to see a chaplain. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is our conundrum. Yeah. Um, and and the uh, palliative team I used to work on, it was asking them to, to take a read on the people that they just got to know in this hour long, I'm guessing, intake they just had at the bedside. But they got to, I don't know, get the ins and the outs and the ups and the downs. Yeah. I think, it, you know, one of the common things when I ask, oh, would you like to see a chaplain? Often immediate answer is no. But if we're going in there together with our chaplain, our palliative care chaplain, there's nobody bats an eye. Um, and also, like we don't ask, is it okay? Like if our social worker sees you, or if our you know palliative care pharmacist sees you, like it's okay. Oh yeah, we're gonna have uh, the rest of our interprofessional team members see you. You know, these are their names. Um, Th- though we do sometimes just push a little pushback. Uh, to my co-host Eric, <laughs> push me <laughs> we back. Sometimes out. say, um, uh, "Would it be okay if the psychologist came to see you?" Um, uh, and there's sometimes pushback around that. And sometimes when they're referring to palliative care, they ask, "Would it be okay if palliative care came to see you?" And the patients may say no. Um, anyway, 
continue uh, on. Thoughts I, on I think I think there's a lot of parallels here between referrals to palliative care and referrals to spiritual care that, you know, at least in our hospital, we try to get our referring clinicians to say, we have a great team here. They're called the palliative care team. They're a great um, support. I'm going to have them come by and see you, not are you okay or don't worry, palliative care is coming. So in the same way, I think doing more of a tell than an ask. Um, and that involves a lot of, you know, trust in the chaplain and the spiritual care department that you're referring to. Um, but I think letting patients know this is a good person and I think they can help you mm-hmm. um, because otherwise they're going to make all kinds of assumptions about what chaplains do. I think that's a really good point, Katie, what you said about know, know what is offered at your institution because there are still some institutions that when they say chaplain, they mean a community clergy person who might be a great community clergy person, might be wonderful in there, you know, uh, uh, giving sermons and things like that. But, you know, to their credit, they've just never been in a palliative care setting. They've never been in healthcare, And so that's going to be a very different situation than someone who has this, you know, clinical pastoral education training, who's even maybe board certified, who knows how to um, assess very quickly when they get into the room, even if the provider, you know, the healthcare provider hasn't um, uh, told the patient that they're coming in, we know how to kind of assess and screen very quickly as, if our presence is causing more harm than good and, you know, know how to, to deal with that. Say more, Allison, about being an educator. Sorry, <laughs> I'm oh, Yeah, yeah. What is a certified pastoral educator? <laughs> right. So, um, turns out, Um, even chaplains are not, um, or, or, you know, religious or spiritual leaders are not born knowing how to give spiritual and pastoral care, um, especially in healthcare. (laughs) I know, right? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, there might be a gene, but we haven't, we haven't found it yet. Um, and so, you know, just like any other, um, you know, discipline, there's, um, an academic training that, um, you know, chaplains and spiritual caregivers go through depends on their, you know, spiritual or religious background. Um, but then there's a clinical training that we all go through. It's 1,600 hours total. And um, three quarters of that is actually clinical um, in, you know, where the the learners are, are functioning in the clinical environment as chaplains, but getting a lot of close supervision. And it's all about reflective practice. So they learn, we learn things about like spiritual assessment and how to recognize different kinds of grief and how to run a family meeting, very concrete skills. Mm -hmm. But there's also a lot about, you know, I as a chaplain or spiritual counselor, I'm using myself very much in the relationship um, Mm -hmm. in the sense that um, I'm being curious about the person's story. I'm empathizing with them. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, trying to draw connections to their values and their maybe spiritual religious, you know, beliefs if they have them. So we want to, we spend these 1600 hours encountering things in the clinical environment that we maybe didn't realize we had an issue with. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then we realize we might need some help around it. And then we get that supervision, you know, kind of in real time or pretty close to it um, from our educator and from, you know, um, peers, because there's always a peer cohort. Um, So it really kind of builds in that reflective practice. Mm -hmm. Uh, And how much palliative care is part of that training and is there a need for like further subspecialization of chaplaincies, chaplains who are really focused, let's say, integrated on a palliative care team? Funny you mention that. <laughs> so that's what I've been working on the last couple of years. And, you know, really interested in hearing what Katie and Paul have to say about that, too, from the research perspective and sort of the workforce perspective. But um, so, yeah, a lot of um, clinical pastoral education programs have students go through the palliative care piece, if at all, towards the end. Um, I think we're maybe trying to protect our relationships with palliative care teams and we don't want to have, you know, the newest learners. I'm not sure. Or Mm -hmm. there are other reasons why that could be, you know, that we want the folks to have these learners to have more skills under their belt. We actually expose them right away at, at UCSD it's it's part of the um you know the entry level internship that they could do um because we just kind of feel like palliative care should just be care um you know it's like one of our closest cousins in spiritual care we're actually recognized as a key component 
you know, on the palliative care team. So we just sort of think we're better to help, you know, fledgling chaplain learners see what the potential of their role can be. So there's some different philosophy about that and some 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 what's called CPE programs that are working on some specialty palliative care curriculum. Mm-hmm. Well, and shout out plug to Allison, who um, was a Cambia Sojourn Scholar and working on, as, as part of her project anyway, working on developing particularly palliative care curriculum in the context of clinical pastoral education. So that's the part that I'll brag on Allison, um, since she won't say for herself. Mm-hmm. There is also, um, Denise Hess would like us very much to mention that there is a specialty certification. So there's board certification, which um, chaplains can apply for. And then there is a specialty uh, certification on top of that in hospice and palliative care. And folks can take a, this is not meant to be a commercial, but they can like the California State University course enables folks to take a step toward that. And should kind of COI reveal that I'm an instructor for that um, as well. Mm -hmm. I guess a question to really to any of you willing to answer is when you think about the current state of training for most chaplains, what do you think is missing the most as far as palliative care skills? I think one thing that I would love to see more of is the um, stepping up and taking leadership. This is something that exists, but I think is being built into the curriculum more in terms of leading family meetings, truly leading family meetings Mm. and stepping out to, to do that. So I'm also um, faculty for vital talk and uh, there's there other than delivering new information about what the scan says for that first time it's ever said, there's, there's not anything that, a chaplain can't do in remap mm-hmm. um, the the mnemonic for goals of care conversations within the vital talk curriculum, and so um, and some of that's a limitation of the training, and a lot of times that's more a limitation, I think, of of the teams and the institutions where the chaplains are at, mm. who don't see chaplains as doing that. Mm-hmm. So it's a challenge in both directions. Yeah. And Katie, you mentioned you, you, you are the director of palliative care mm-hmm. at your medical center. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about um, uh, your role in le- at your particular institution at leading teams and uh, in clinical work? Yeah. So I um, oversee our inpatient palliative care team um, and uh, we have a, a growing outpatient presence. So I do... Uh, team maintaining, I interface, I'm the admin side of our of our leadership dyad. Um, and I also do education. So I do vital talk training throughout our system and mm-hmm. some in Southern California. So help working with our family medicine residency program and um, make sure that our team stays healthy and that our relationships throughout the hospital with, with all of our different constituents, clinical and non, mm-hmm. uh, stay stay healthy and robust. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. it, it's there. There are not many of us who are chaplains and also oversee palliative care programs. I think it's a it's a mm-hmm. funny little niche. Yeah, when I think about the moments where the chaplains have led the conversation and really stepped up, the the one that comes to mind the most, some of the most powerful experiences I've had in clinical practice are after the patient has died, and there's a family request the chaplain come and the chaplain comes and there's just, you know, this outpouring of emotion and grief that is led by the chaplain often or channeled or, you know, navigated by the chaplain and that incredibly strong emotion. It's such a delicate time. And the way that the chaplains have navigated that is just so deeply uncomfortable for most doctors, right. Um, and outside of their comfort zone. And yet the cha- chaplains, like this is a, key part of what they've always done, right? And that's the key part of all of their training, as you're saying. Um, so incredibly um, powerful. Um, I, I don't really have a question in there, but yeah, no, it's certainly I one think place where they do already that. take leadership. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's definitely a place where chaplains shine. I also um, would, would advocate that. I think that that sort of frequency that you, it can really pul- palpably feel after there's been a death often. I think that's always there in serious illness. It's just, you know, sometimes 
uh, there's some distractions and other times you see actually if the chaplain is called much, much earlier, like I see that I do a lot of work in outpatient palliative care. Um, and so we see patients for a long time and, you know, you'd think so far upstream, a chaplain wouldn't be necessary, but, you know, I walk through the door and all of a sudden there's this whole other frequency that, that gets tuned into just because the patient and the family say, oh, the chaplain's here. So I guess it's okay for me to talk about this. Mm-hmm. And I think sometimes that permission is only given closer to end of life. And, you know, I think we can really help uh, in the whole spectrum. Yeah, I completely agree. That's it. the other place where I've seen chaplains take a leading role is when they, the chaplains we've worked with have had really long relationships with patients. And sometimes they know the pa- often some, maybe they know the patients better than we know the patients because um, we rotate in and out, in and out. And the chaplains are often all uh, uh, on service much more frequently. And that they develop these longitudinal relationships with patients that we aren't privy to. And they know about sort of the core struggle that the patient's facing uh, in the setting of serious illness and that way that it's um, threatening their sense of identity and personhood and meaning um, in a way that we maybe haven't assessed or aren't familiar with. Um, So absolutely agree. That's another place where I've seen chaplains take a leading role. So I mean, going back to is okay if we move away from chaplaincy to the rest of the interprofessional team. I think back to I think it was Holly Perkison's study, coping with cancer study, um, looking at you know spiritual and religious support by the medical team, and uh, for if I remember correctly, we don't exactly know what people said or meant when they said they felt supported by the spiritual team. I uh, felt felt supported spiritually by the medical team, but when they felt m- more supported, they had greater odds of receiving hospice care, and they were less likely to receive aggressive end of life care. Which is kind of opposite if you look at people who use you know, positive religious coping. It's actually interesting that they actually use more end of life care and less hospice care if they have have that. And I'm just wondering. What what does it mean to be supported by spiritually supported by the medical team? That's a great study, by the way. That, that whole crowd with Holly Pregerson and yeah, the Tracy Balboni, Michael Balboni, Andrea Phelps, all mm-hmm. that. Yeah, that was some amazing data got cranked out of that um, world. And you're right, we loved we would have loved it if they could stratify the chaplain out of that um, data set and somehow say that we stood out as a variable. I know we didn't, but. It's still very exciting that the team perceptively, as you said, had these amazing outcomes that when they were involved. And yeah, this genuine sense of um, being cared for, I I suppose, is the uh, sense, you know, the meaning, connection, and purpose tied with that definition Allison mentioned before, I think is critical to that. But that people attend to their story, the struggles that they're evidencing that they name, that we are able to say, we want to sit with that, we care about that. I think palliative people are drawn to the story, period. Physician, mm-hmm. PA, um, NP, uh, clinical social worker. They're, we're all kind of in this um, world. We all love to swim in that sea of values. So I think um, there's a nice congealing. I I had my most fun clinically when I got to be on the palliative care team for 10 years because of that, I think, uh, uh, kinship among interprofessionals. The other thing that I think I'd add to what you said, Paul, is um, in terms of the other members of the team and how how a patient might experience that, I think a lot of it has to do with when it comes up from the patient. So if the patient just says something like, well, we're going to leave it in God's hands, or I'm going to need to pray on this, or um, I'm hoping for a miracle. I'm hoping for a miracle. Yep. I feel like the universe is just getting back at me. Um, Mm -hmm. there's, there's a moment when I think people on the team, um, can either sort of lean into that or pull way back from that and say something like, yes, well, how is your belly pain? (laughs) Um, and so I just hang around me a lot. (laughs) (laughs) Um, so if for patients to feel cared for, spiritually and existentially when they bring up those concerns and they are as allison astutely said i think that frequency is there all the time um if the rest of the team can develop some comfort and some uh and and i would turn to your 
chaplains, spiritual care providers mm-hmm. at your institution for that for help with that too. But to be able to receive that, sit in that for a minute, and then appropriately for refer. Can I ask? So let's go to the the. I think the universe is just getting back at me. What would be some options as far as a response that isn't? Oh, let's talk about your belly pain. Tell me more about that. Uh, right, you know all of these great skills and curiosity. You know, yeah. curious communication that palliative care members have and pride themselves on for the most yeah. part. You know that you can use that for anything. You know, even even spiritual talk. Yeah, I'm going to ask you a couple other kind of go like communication tips about addressing this. I think one of them also is not try to fix it right away. So, no, the universe is not trying to you know harm you. But I wonder, like, if I ask somebody, let's let's just go back to like the FICA. So, you know, part of the F is you know asking about faith, belief, and meaning. Do you consider yourself spiritual or religious? And they say no. Like, all right, I can end the conversation there. But is there are there tips to go deeper potentially, Paul? Yeah, well, I remember you know from listening to a previous podcast, you talked about Dr. Ken Kavinsky, and he's been a part of this. And I would recognize—I remember before part of his fight, I'd say, "You're a long-standing suffering Cubs fan," <laughs> and I would probably invite a moment about Steve Bartman and and uh, to, to to commiserate with him a little bit about that, to sit with him in that suffering. I mean, all joking aside, it is—it's trying to find that connection point, or even recalling back. You know, I thought I, you know, I read a note somewhere that you had said this to the chaplain, or finding that point uh, where you, um, your humanity means so much to me, and uh, that isn't maybe necessarily explicitly said, but it's um, the sense that I'm, I'm in this chair, I'm not going to go anywhere, and what is happening to you means a lot to uh, this moment. And except that we know that you do have to go somewhere. <laughs> You know, I mean, we do too, but especially, you know, I think physicians, nursing, um, you know, all the other disciplines. And so I think one of the things is like, in some cases we have the time, you know, our time is set aside for this. um, And that, you know, if you could start the conversation and then use some good curiosity by asking them to tell you more, and then it's, you know, going to be setting like a, a healthy limit of saying, I have a certain amount of time today. This is the amount of time I have so that you can sort of manage their expectations. And then that could be a good way to, um, you know, sort of pass the baton and let them know there's a whole specialist on our team that works exactly with the kinds of things mm-hmm. you're telling me today. I got to ask question. about a couple others. Go ahead, Alex. I want to see what your thoughts, if you have any pointers for our, the clinicians who are listening and there's um, some of them may be on teams that have no chaplain or no, but and many of them may be on teams that, um, work with chaplaincy in their uh, medical center, but they're not specifically uh, palliative care trained chaplains. And so, um, w- w- what if what, what thoughts from you on initial thoughts on you know patient says that they believe in miracles, hoping for a miracle or family. This comes up uh, quite frequently. And any initial thoughts on how to approach that? Well, there's the 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 really great the Amen protocol. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was published recently, and you'll have to help me remember um, all of the acronym, but it, it's a line, which is sort of a critical palliative care skill anyway, right? Is mm-hmm. to maintain alignment as you're as you're assessing people's values and learning about them, maintaining alignment. So if somebody says early on, um, well, I realize you say that she's lost almost all brain function, but, um, I, I just don't believe that. Mm-hmm. Um, you can't really argue with somebody about that. So maintaining alignment and leaning into the relationship meeting and it's them, the same meeting them where they're at, meeting them where they're at. Yeah. Exactly. It just, uh, it's affirm, meet, educate, no matter what. Uh-huh. Thank you. Paul. No ma- N is no matter what. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's like non-abandonment. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 My other, I, I just learned this uh, a few weeks ago and it's become one of my favorite ways to respond to the miracle piece. And it's um, all, all credit. It's evidently from uh, Bob Arnold. Uh, if somebody says, well, we're just hoping for a miracle is to say, it must be really hard to be in a place where you need a miracle. It's huh. good. I think it's okay. Are we talking about biology there, but <laughs> um, sorry, you know, But I was thinking the other, I I love talking about miracles um, because I think it's one of the most um, misunderstood words 
<laughs> mm-hmm. um, in spiritual care. Um, and as I'd say over the past maybe six or seven years, all of a sudden a bunch of what they called taxonomies came out about miracles in healthcare. And sort of the upshot of that is that there are those miracles that are harmless, you know, and they don't really impact, you know, decision making even. In fact, if anything, they may even support. And then there are the miracles that I think a lot of providers yeah. maybe even fear that could not saying too much or judging too much about a person's theology, but they could even kind of be a little bit harmful, um, you know, for the person. So this idea that when we look at them, not all miracles are, you know, are created the same. And that, again, that curiosity about what kind of miracle is this and how this is functioning mm. for the patient gives us a lot of um, guidance. Yeah, I love the question. What does a miracle look like to you? What mm-hmm. would that look like? Because we've had patients who say, oh, the miracle would be that I get a die at home. Um, right. yeah. Hey, that's that's really different than we can do what that. I was yeah. in my head, what you were <laughs> trying to say when you said you were hoping for a miracle. Can I ask also, what this comes up often, uh, will you pray with me, doctor? Um, thoughts on how we might respond to that, particularly for doctors who may be atheist or of a different religion than the patient uh, who's asking them to pay, pray with them. So, uh, Paul, did you want to jump in on this oh, one? I, I know, I this is <laughs> this a hot potato. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you no. know, I, I'm not going to necessarily change hearts and minds on this because I understand there's a deep history with people's own you know, sense of either feeling close to prayer or feeling very alienated by it. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I just always think about how prayer is really just like please or thank you you know it's mm-hmm. it's just kind of expressing or you know could be expressing the depths of your heart and soul but often it's just sort of a a please or thank you or an a, a praising you know or pr- expressing appreciation or gratitude and i think any anyone could do that whatever their background is mm-hmm. so it's a question of i guess for the for the medical provider you know does it feel so inauthentic mm-hmm. that that's going to create a wedge with the patient or mm-hmm can the the medical provider do a little interpretation inside their own mind and say, Oh, I know what what the person's saying for prayer is they're really just wanting me to engage in that sort of human, you know, human interaction. Yeah. Really like that phrasing, Allison. Paul, you were going to say something. No, there was a great fast fact on this um, that I really like. And then, but I also just want to name, I've heard physicians tell me, I don't believe in what you're, they don't say this explicitly. They'll say this to me later. I don't believe what they're saying, but I recognize it's important for them. And I'll say, you know, I'll, I'll be in the room and your way of understanding, you know, God or the divine, that's important to me. And I want to support that. So I'm going to respect that and stay here. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll be by your side while you do that. Mm-hmm. And I got a question for you, Paul. Like, as we think about these big questions that are coming up, whether it be miracles or how to respond, or even thinking about like, what does it mean to be supported spiritually by your medical team? You know, there's a lot of need for palliative care research. Um, is this a researchable topic? <laughs> Are any of these, can we address them through research? I'm so thankful you asked it, yes. And we are so thankful to some of the people who have led the way here, the George Hachettes, the George Hanzos, the Betty Farrows, the Christina Pukowskis, and people right now like the Phil Choi's, the Far Curlins, and the Natalie Earnkoffs that are really putting a lens on this, saying Domain 5 is really important to all of us. And um, yes, yeah, so we're... There's some really good outcome-based studies that are out there, and we're hoping to keep collecting all these pilot studies, and hopefully the NIH will see us someday to say, we're going to give you a big pile of money to research this some more. And I'd love to have people come and join us in the um, Hospice Palliative Spiritual Care Research Network with Transforming Chaplaincy. It's free. There's almost 700 of us at this point, and people who care about what the evidence um, can mean to inform um, or apply to my work. It's a great community, just to put in a plug for it. I Paul does a great job of uh, building a great community there. And if we wanted Thank to join, what would it, where would we go? Well, I, I noticed sometimes on your website that you have links. Um, we do have a link, and it functions like a key to the front door because we keep them closed so that we don't have any advertising. So it's just a place to um, explore, inform, coordinate, connect with um, other folks who care about it. And it's not just for chaplain spiritual care folk. We have physicians, health services, researchers, other people that are part of it. Great. We'll have a link to that. I also wonder in our last couple of minutes, if I can ask each of you, if you had a magic wand, you can have healthcare practitioners or teams like do one thing when it comes to addressing spiritual care needs uh, of patients and family members. 
what would that magic wand be for you? Alice, I'm going to turn to you first. Yeah. Um, I would want every single provider to attend to their own spiritual health in a way that means something to them. Cause I just really believe that if, if, um, if all of our palliative care providers are um, at their best and their most, you know, sort of integrated and grounded, they're just going to be in such a better position to be able to be present to patients for themselves and, and make make the connections, um, you know, to a chaplain or to other specialists. Great. Um, Paul? My favorite definition for religion is it means being gripped by a story. So finding those places of connection. So we do find those sincere moments of meaning, value, and transcendence, not just for that patient and not connected even to God, but, you know, a 2016 World Series, for example. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, go back to Ken right there. Um, uh, Katie, what you got for me? Uh, I'll be real practical and say if I had a magic wand, I would want um, health care organizations to acknowledge and invest in board-certified chaplains. Mm -hmm. Um, to acknowledge that this is a specialization and it takes Mm -hmm. special training and you should pay professionals um, accordingly. Yeah, here, here. Completely agree. Yeah. And I think it's fascinating too, like going back to the coping with cancer study, like supporting, I mean, the the part of the reason palliative care has grown so much is that there was a business case around it. Mm -hmm. I think from coping with cancer, there was a, Acknowledgement that addressing spiritual needs for a healthcare system, it just doesn't make good spiritual and medical sense. It also helps potentially kind of from a business case as well. Oh, hey, Alex, any other questions from your end? I know we're no, running I'm out good. of time. A little more Jeff Tweedy? A little more Jeff Tweedy. Jeff Tweedy. All right, we get to hear the end of the song. Um, here we go. Actually, it starts out with the word the end. At the end of the end of this beautiful dream we're in I'll wake up again a robin or wren then I'll sit outside your window I'll sing a song you'll recognize Oh, why? You won't know why. Then a tear drop will fall into the corner of the smile on your face, and I'll be alive. Allison, Katie, Paul, big thank you for joining us on the Jerry Pop Podcast. It's been absolutely fabulous. And we will have a link to the network too on our show notes. Thank you guys so much. This has really been fun. Thank you as always, Archstone Foundation, for your continued support. And to all of our listeners, thank you for supporting the Jerry Pop Podcast. Bye, everybody.